My name is Sophia Bourgeois, and I work in the Advancement Department at the Burke Neurological Institute. I wanted to start this meeting by taking a moment to thank you all for being with us here today. We at BNI understand that this is a difficult time for everyone, and we appreciate that you have chosen to spend the next hour with us here today. For today's meeting, Dr. Rajiv Rattan will spend 25 minutes discussing the science of COVID-19, more specifically its biology, the impact it has on neurological conditions, and its involvement in the central nervous system. Following his briefing, you will have the opportunity to ask Dr. Rattan any questions you may have. We hope that you will take full advantage of this time and that you will leave this meeting feeling informed and filled with hope. I will now introduce you to Christine Hughes, Burke Neurological Institute's Vice President of Institutional Advancement, who will be introducing Dr. Rajiv Rattan. Thanks so much, Sophia. Dr. Rajiv Rattan received his BA in Neuroscience magna cum laude from Amherst College in 1981 and received the John Woodruff Simpson Fellowship in Medicine. He completed an MD and PhD at the New York University School of Medicine where he graduated as a member of Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society in 1988. He completed his PhD with Dr. Michael Shalansky, Chair of Pathology at Columbia University, and Dr. Frederick Maxfield, Chair of Biochemistry at Cornell, where he focused on novel methods to monitor calcium gradients in living cells. He, became, he completed his internship in medicine at the University of Chicago and was a neurology resident and then chief resident in neurology at Johns Hopkins from 1991 to 1992. He was awarded the J. Slocken Award for Excellence in Research while a resident and subsequently received the Fasano Foundation Clinician Science Award while completing a fellowship in neurorehabilitation and a postdoc in the Department of Neuroscience at Hopkins. In 1994, he was promoted to assistant professor of neurology and rehab medicine at Hopkins, and he started his own lab with the help of his postdoc mentor, Jay Barabin. In 1996, he was recruited to set up the Neuroprotection Laboratory in the Department of Neurology and Program in Neuroscience at Harvard Medical School, Harvard Institutes of Medicine, and Beth Israel Hospital. He became an associate professor at Harvard in 1999. In 2002, Dr. Rattan and his family moved to Westchester County, New York to lead the Burke Neurological Institute. He was appointed the Winifred Masterson Burke Professor of Neurology and Neuroscience at Weill Cornell Medical College in 2004 and named an Associate Dean for the Medical College in 2011. Among countless accomplishments, award, and lectures during his time at the Institute, Dr. Rattan recently received notification that he will be inducted into the prestigious John Hopkins Society of Scholars in April of, 20, of 2020. Thank you, Dr. Rattan, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. I'm gonna turn off my video and I'm gonna hand it over. Thanks, Christine, for that very nice introduction. I always uh, wish my mom were around uh, to kind of uh, hear, hear that. I'm sure she would. She would be proud. Um, it's great to have all of you here. Um, I know these are trying um, circumstances. We're hoping to give you some information that hopefully will enable you to uh, connect the dots on what is amounting to be a, a, a welter of information uh, that's coming from a lot of different sources. So. Uh, the goal today is not to overwhelm and confuse you, but hopefully to give you ammunition to try to figure out um, what uh, information you're getting from so many sources is, is meaningful and, and what you should be maybe more skeptical about. I also wanted to say before I start that for those of you, any of you who are having uh, challenges in your health, um, either uh, directly related to uh, COVID-19 or sort of just uh, from the anxiety that this has provoked that um, we're uh, wishing you all uh, well and, and good health. And for those of you who are, have maintained your health, I think it's obviously a priority uh, uh, to be doing the things that are necessary to, to keep us all uh, well. 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, try to uh, make this a very uh, basic. Uh, I uh, sometimes have a tendency to drift into jargon. So at the end, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions, um, and uh, so I can clarify things that maybe weren't so clear. Uh, I'm gonna start by actually uh, telling you about what a virus is. Um, and giving you some of the background about how COVID-19 actually emerged. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about its most common features, uh, many of which don't involve the central nervous system, and then try to give you um, a, uh, some insight into uh, information really that is quite preliminary about uh, risks it posed for the nervous system. So the question, uh, first question is what is a virus? And, and many of you actually may know what a virus is, but I, I think it's always helpful to uh, start with these definitions. A virus is a very small parasite that carries instructions of how to reproduce itself. So it has a viral coat uh, illustrated by this uh, beautiful down Nike jacket and it has either RNA or DNA. And what these uh, substances do is they carry the instructions for how to assemble a new virus. And that's illustrated by these instructions here. So um, one uh, uh, important point is, is that viruses are extremely small. So in one centimeter, which is a, a, a four tenths of an inch, um, you can have up to 500,000 virus particles. Um, as I mentioned, uh, and if you look at this figure here, there's a viral coat, and the coat has these uh, spikes, which are actually proteins, that almost look like uh, spikes on a crown. And that's uh, the reason why uh, the virus, uh, the coronaviruses are named coronaviruses because they have these spikes, and these spikes um, look like a crown. The other thing that the viral coat has is it has an envelope, and that envelope is made up of a lipid, which is kind of a greasy substance that has a hydrophobic interior and a hydrophilic exterior. And um, I think that it's important to note that this uh, uh, envelope is made up of lipids because uh, for many of you, you might wonder why do people tell me to wash with soap and water? Well, as you, as you know from using, for instance, butter when you cook, butter is very greasy. And if you try to clean a pan uh, without using soap and water, you don't, uh, you're not able to get it off. The same is true with viruses. Because of this greasy envelope, you're, if you use detergents, it puts holes in this envelope and essentially releases the contents of the virus. And the internal contents of the virus are here, and this is the viral, in the case of coronaviruses, the RNA, and again, remember that this uh, carries the instructions for how to assemble a new virus. So as you can see, viruses are extremely simple so simple that they don't have any machinery that allows them to actually survive on their own. They have this coat made of protein and lipid, and then they have RNA or DNA, in the case of coronaviruses, RNA, with the instructions of how to assemble. So they actually need another organism to be able to survive because they need an organism that's gonna allow them to uh, be able to take that roadmap of how to replicate and actually uh, utilize the host machinery. And um, humans have become increasingly exposed to new viruses that were historically resident only in animals like bats and rodents. Now, um, you guys have probably heard a lot about, oh, uh, this virus emerged from people eating bats. Well, there is some truth to that. And, uh, and the reason uh, bats, uh, bats are actually great hosts 
for many of the viruses that you're hearing a lot about. Uh, Ebola, uh, Nipah, Ebola is a virus that many of you, um, which uh, is prevalent in Africa. Nipah is another virus which developed in Malaysia. Uh, MERS, which refers to the Middle East Rep Respiratory Syndrome, uh, a syndrome that developed in 2008 and 2009 in the, in the Middle East. And, uh, and SARS is another virus that you've probably heard of. Um, the, this is uh, the Sudden Acute uh, Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Uh, and uh, all of these viruses originated in uh, bats. Um, so why are bats such good hosts for viruses? Well, uh, it, bats, sort of like humans, hate social distancing. So viruses spread avidly in the bat communities. It also turns out that bats have a number of features of their immune system that allows the, allow them to coexist with viruses and not die. So when a bat gets infected, they uh, generate a large repertoire, repertoire of, of antibodies. These are the proteins that actually neutralize uh, viruses. And the repertoire that they can generate from their immune system, surprisingly, is much greater than what a human can generate. So when a sees a new virus that they've never seen before, we have, uh, uh, we have mechanisms by which we can convert that into a specific antibody response that only targets that uh, virus. Well, it turns out bats are much better at doing that than humans. So the virus infects the bat, but it doesn't kill the bat. The other th interesting thing is, is that when bats fly, their body temperature goes up, uh, usually to 40 degrees, much like uh, we experience when we have a fever. And it, it turns out, and, and this may surprise many of you, it turns out that um, fevers are actually quite beneficial. And our historical tendency is when we have a fever, we take a Tylenol or something else to knock down the fever. But it, in fact, new data suggests that maybe you should just let it ride, that the fever is actually good because what the fever does is it enhances immune cell function that allows you then to uh, uh, combat uh, viruses and other infections. And so bats, because they're flying around all, all the time, are at a higher temperature and that inhibits virus survival. So most interestingly, recent, a recent group in Wuhan has actually looked at um, the evolution of genes in bats that are highly divergent. And they've actually found mutations in genes involved in immune responses and DNA damage. And what we'll talk about a little bit at the end is that actually these mutations lead bats to have a very active and robust immediate immune response, but to turn that immune response off very quickly so that anti-inflammatory and, re and, and resolution responses happen much more quickly than in humans. Now, even if bats are good hosts for viruses like COVID-19, the question is, how would they get to humans? And there are really two major theories that have uh, a lot of support. Um, and they're really uh, stories uh, that are as much uh, epidemiology and detective work as they are um, rigorous science in a laboratory. So um, one of the mechanisms is that uh, humans uh, often eat sap uh, that's contaminated by bat viruses or they eat pigs that have been contaminated by these viruses. So historically, bats have lived in the jungles in places like Malaysia and Bangladesh, and they haven't been in contact with humans or uh, uh, animals that humans eat. But as um, we've, uh, populations have grown, these jungles have been cut down, and now uh, humans are moving closer uh, to where bats live. 
And so um, there's been greater exposure. And uh, one of the popular things to do in countries like Bangladesh is to eat the, the sap of the date palm tree. And so they collect the sap in these canisters at the bottom of the tree. And when the bats actually eat the sap, because it's very sweet and tasty, uh, they become contaminated with bat viruses. And when they become contaminated with bat viruses and humans eat them, they then uh, become infected. The other thing is, is that uh, as uh, agriculture has moved closer to the jungles and pig farms have evolved in areas of Malaysia and Bangladesh, um, the pigs have been eating food that's actually contaminated by bat viruses. And so when humans eat those contaminated pigs, they catch the virus. So the other uh, uh, story, which is probably more relevant to COVID-19, is uh, the wet food markets in southern China. And this has a very interesting um, and somewhat poignant uh, history. Many of you may be aware of the Great Famine of China in 1960. So it turns out that uh, uh, because of um, communist policies uh, that were implemented, um, uh, many, many people in China uh, were undernourished, undernourished to the point where 30 million people uh, died. And this uh, deficiency, uh, food shortage actually, persisted until the mid 70s when uh, Deng Xiaoping lifted state controls on rural farming of plants and animals. And, uh, uh, and so wild animals became a staple of rural farming. And you can imagine that for a country that uh, essentially had food deficiencies for many years, it led people to think very creatively about what types of food they might eat, including uh, eating animals that probably uh, in countries where food was more abundant, they would never uh, actually consider eating them. And over time, these rural farms became a substantial industry. And the mechanism by which these now industrial uh, farms, which were making all types of, breeding all types of animals, would bring the, their goods to market, would be wet food markets, um, where uh, animals, both traditional and exotic, are slaughtered. And they're slaughtered in very unsanitary conditions, often uh, to be sold for eating. So uh, the reason why this latter story becomes so relevant to the story of COVID-19 is that 27 of the 41 of the first individuals infected with COVID-19 went to the same wet animal market in Wuhan. And this is what they look at. They're very, very crowded. And they're actually, uh, you go to these markets and the animals are alive and they're actually slaughtered there. And because there's so little room, you have animals stacked on top of each other that are um, you know, often uh, 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 relieving themselves uh, on top of other animals that ultimately uh, can be eaten. So it's really a, uh, a, a fertile uh, festering ground for uh, infection. And in fact, as you've probably heard, the Chinese government is uh, likely gonna shut these wet markets down. So let me summarize what I've told you so far because it's a lot of information in a short period of time. So viruses are very small. This is what uh, allows them uh, uh, to, to uh, be projected in air droplets, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the, importantly, they cannot survive on their own. They require a host to survive. And uh, they have a coat, uh, which includes uh, proteins that allow them to recognize receptors on specific cells of their host, and a nucleic acid, which is uh, the roadmap or the instructions uh, for how to reproduce uh, the virus, including all of its proteins, it's in its envelope. Um, this roadmap requires a host with the cellular machinery to read the roadmap, in this case RNA, and convert it into the production of new viruses. And as I mentioned, bats are ideal hosts 
because they're social, they've evolved mechanisms which allow the viruses to live and reproduce without killing the bat. Um, and uh, as we discussed, bat viruses have been transmitted to humans via multiple mechanisms, um, both involving uh, the extension of civilization out into the jungles and uh, the movement of uh, a large um, industrial production of animals to wet uh, food markets in uh, places like Southern China. So let's talk now about COVID-19. As many of you have heard, it primarily infects the lung and uh, sequence data now confirms that uh, the virus that is uh, making its way around the United States has 88% sequence identity with bat-derived coronaviruses. So that means that its code is identical to the viruses that are normally found in bats. Um, and person-to-person -person contact occurs via air droplets. So air droplets occur either when you speak or when you cough or sneeze. And uh, these air droplets, because viruses are so, so small, they can, uh, they can survive on these air droplets. And I, I think um, the, there is data from MIT which shows that um, when you cough or sneeze, that your air droplet can project up to 18 feet. So that's six meters. And this is why you can understand why using a mask is probably a good thing to do now, because if you are just speaking, the distance may be four or five feet. That's the reason why we have a six feet rule, six foot rule for social distancing. But if somebody's sick with the virus, their ability to project virus with sneezing or coughing is up to 18 feet. And so you would want that person to have a mask on. So these viruses it have uh, an affinity or a tropism to a group of cells that line the lung called the lung epithelia. And these cells in the lung, which are present, so epithelial cells are present on many of the surfaces um, that um, are really protecting us from outside parts of our body. So they're in the lung, they're in the gut, they're actually also in our uh, vascular system, on our, our uh, arteries. Um, and, and it turns out that the lung epithelia have very high concentrations of the receptor for COVID-19 called angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And if you look over here at this picture, you see that most of the symptoms are rhinorrhea, that's uh, actually um, you know, when you're uh, dripping mucus from your nose, sneezing, sore throat, pneumonia, um, and, um, and, and people can actually even get to the point um, where they have what's called acute respiratory distress syndrome, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. There are also are systemic disorders and, um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those as well. Okay, so COVID-19 binds to this receptor. So here you can see these uh, the schematics of the virus with its corona-like uh, spikes. And these spikes, a single spike binds to a single angiotensin converting enzyme receptor. So this is the air of the lung and this is the epithelial cell. Um, and when you would uh, breathe in uh, a, a virus, let's say from someone else, um, the virus would bind to the receptor, it's internalized, the coat is removed, the RNA is released into the cytoplasm of the lung cell, and the machinery of the human cell is now used by the virus to be able to replicate and generate new viruses. And this is the way that the virus actually replicates in the body. Now, this receptor here, ACE2, is present on the epithelial cells of the lung, of the kidney, of the intestine. That's why uh, you've probably heard reports about diarrhea being a uh, initial symptom, and uh, the blood vessels. And, uh, there are inhibitors 
of angiotensin converting enzyme one, not two. There are different enzymes that are used to treat hypertension, and those inhibitors have no effect on the receptor for, um, they have no direct effect. They have an indirect effect in that people with diabetes, or you've probably been told not to take ibuprofen, or another class of drugs called the thiazolidines, um, which are used as anti-diabetic agents, uh, they all have the property of upregulating this receptor. So, um, so the respiratory epithelium expresses this receptor, and here's a, skip, uh, a diagram of the human uh, respiratory system, and, and, and here is the trachea, here are the lungs, and you can see the alveoli of the lungs are the interface between oxygen in the air uh, being delivered to oxygen in our blood. That's actually how we get oxygen that allows us to survive and generate ATP. Um, so this epithelium is critical in that it is a barrier, it's a protective barrier between the air and the human body and the lungs. And what these epithelial cells do is they produce two substances that are very familiar uh, to many of you, um, but very important. So mucus is produced by these cells, and what the mucus does is it traps not only particulate matter, but it also tra traps viruses and bacteria before they enter the body, and then you, as you expectorate, you get rid of that mucus. They also produce a substance which is more important in the parts of the lung where air is interfacing with the blood. Um, it's, uh, um, and, and it's a substance called surfactant. And, and the best way to describe surfactant is, uh, many of you have um, you know, played with uh, bubbles and you know when you blow bubbles, uh, sometimes the trick is to get them actually to float before they pop. Well, in the, in the lung, what keeps our alveoli, which are like bubbles, uh, inflated is the stuff called surfactant, which uh, allows them not to essentially pop. Um, and, and these epithelial cells not only produce surfactant and mucus, but they also produce um, substances that are important in repair and modulating the immune response. So how is it that when the virus binds to these cells that it actually causes the damage? So the th one of the thoughts is, and this is from a, a recent article in the New England Journal of Medicine, is that um, when the virus binds to ACE2 and is taken up into the cell, it's now removing all of this angiocontensin er converting enzyme two from the surface. And the normal function of this enzyme is actually to cleave two substances, angiotensin one and angiotensin two, into smaller peptides. So once this is downregulated, you end up having more of these substances. They then bind to their receptors, and in small amounts, angiotensin two is actually protective, but in large amounts, it can cause acute lung injury, uh, it actually can cause heart failure. It, it, it causes uh, vasoconstriction, which can limit full flow, and it also causes permeability of the vessels to fluids. And this can be particularly a problem in the lung where when the, the vessels that are trying to get oxygen become leaky, they start to leak fluid into the alveoli. And if fluid is in the alveoli, then the oxygen has no way of accessing the blood. And this is um, uh, 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 what we talk about when we talk about acute respiratory distress syndrome. It's essentially the blood, the lungs fill up with fluid and there's absolutely no way to get oxygen uh, to the blood. So what's interesting about this model, and I understand it's a lot of information, but the most important thing to take away from this is that the virus actually downregulates the receptor on the surface of the cells, and the downregulation of that receptor it may be critical to the subsequent injury processes. So the idea that people with diabetes and who've been taking antihypertensives 
may have more of this receptor on the surface may actually protect them than create vulnerability. And again, this is a, another misinformation that has been passed around, this idea that people with taking these, uh, uh, who have more uh, receptor on their surface would do worse and be at higher risk. Okay, so let me summarize again what I've, I've told you. So COVID-19 binds to a receptor. Remember that viruses are able to infect their hosts by binding to specific receptors. And where those receptors are expressed will determine which organs and what part of the body are actually affected. So COVID-19 binds to angiotensin converting enzyme, uh, two on the surface of epithelial cells in the lung, kidney, intestine, and blood vessels. These are sites of infection in the body. It's uh, that ACE2 uh, is increased in diabetes, and people who are on angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, it's a drug called Captopril. Uh, many of you may have heard of it, and this may actually protect them from problems with COVID-19. Um, a reduction of ACE2 by COVID-19 leads to increased production of a uh, protein, a peptide called angiotensin II, which can mediate a host of injury responses to the lung, to the heart, and throughout the body. Okay, so patients with neurological conditions that affect swallowing, coughing, or breathing are at increased risk for complications. So in uh, patients who have swallowing dysfunction, either due to stroke or Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, you can imagine that if you're building up this mucus and trying to get rid of the virus, that that might be, uh, that might be a problem for somebody who has trouble with swallowing and controlling uh, expectoration. Uh, central cord uh, control of breathing is deficient in patients, for instance, who have spinal cord injuries. And their ability to optimally inflate uh, their lungs um, puts them at risk um, for uh, problems like pneumonia as well as ARDS. Uh, patients with ALS who have central and peripheral control of breathing problems because the musculature is weak um, would also be at risk. Uh, peripheral control of breathing is also relevant and patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome and acute uh, post-infectious syndrome uh, would be at risk. And finally, um, uh, patients with muscular dystrophy who have problems with the strength of their muscles per se, but normal nervous systems also would be at risk. So uh, it, it's important for these groups of patients to be uh, hyper aware of dis social distancing uh, and all of the mechanisms that have wearing masks, et cetera because they're at, at increased risk. But the question that you've all come to hear about today is, is the brain infected by COVID-19? And, and obviously you might say, well, um, COVID-19 is kind of the, the evil uh, twin of, of SARS-CoV-1. Uh, Can't we just look at what happened with SARS and see whether, and they bind to the same receptor. So can't we really just look at that and see what we would anticipate to be the nervous system abnormalities. Well, it turns out that um, uh, with SARS, surprisingly, only eight, you know, now only, we say only, it's, it's still a remarkable number, uh, 8,000 people were infected and 800 died. So it's a much smaller uh, group of individuals in which to potentially see CNS manifestations. So the way that, uh, you know, I was uh, taught um, uh, through out, outstanding training from actually one of the leading neurovirologists in the world, Richard Johnson, to kind of approach clinical problems in neurology was to ask first, are brain symptoms focal or diffuse? Because if you can figure out if they're focal or diffuse, then that helps you to understand what might be uh, the etiology. And when we say focal, it, it re refers to something like not being able to smell or taste or having the weakness of one arm but not the other 
or not being able to speak, which uh, there are language centers that are localized to a very restricted area of the brain. Whereas diffuse injury refers to things that don't necessarily localize to a particular area of the brain. Uh, one of the most sensitive assays of diffuse injury in the brain is that people become sleepy uh, to the point uh, where they can become comatose or they complain of headache or they they complain of generalized slowness in thinking. And the, uh, the other thing to remember, so you have focal or diffuse injury, that focal injury can be unmasked by diffuse injury. So when I was an intern at the University of Chicago, we um, gave uh, uh, a diabetic patient insulin and she didn't eat her breakfast and her glucose level dropped to 40. And um, she experienced uh, focal weakness in one of her arms. And it turns out that she had a critical stenosis um, in one of the vessels going to the motor cortex. And it was only in the setting of the hypoglycemia from having too much insulin that that focal, that stenosis became manifest. And it was actually lucky because we gave her some uh, glucose and her symptoms normalized, but we were ultimately able to correct uh, the stenosis. So this was, uh, uh, this is a, a uh, just a re reminding you that, that on the wards, uh, 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 when you round with your attending and you know, the residents are there and the nurses, the whole team's there, uh, the first question we were always asked was, is this a focal problem or is this a diffuse problem? And I think, Thinking about uh, COVID-19 manifestations in that way is helpful. Here's an, a CT from a patient who had a stroke, and you can see the damage is very focal, um, as opposed to somebody who might have a diffuse encephalitis, where you would see swelling throughout the brain. So let's talk about potential focus, focal injury in COVID-19. Uh, many of you have heard about loss of smell and taste, and it uh, turns out that uh, the olfactory system, like the visual system, are parts of the central nervous system that are actually exposed um, to the outside world. And uh, right here, so this is, this is the area where this box is that's being represented here. And you see these olfactory neurons, which uh, come outside of the nervous system and uh, allow you to uh, smell and uh, information is transmitted uh, back through what's called the cribriform plate uh, to the olfactory bulb. And, uh, and so uh, uh, there are many reports that individuals with COVID-19 cannot smell or taste, and it's raised a lot of interest as to whether this reflects infection by COVID-19 of these neurons that would be exposed uh, in the upper respiratory tract to uh, viruses. Now, uh, there's really no evidence in humans that this is a pervasive or substantiated problem. And uh, as you know, if you're, as you, many of you have experienced, if, you're, if your nares are filled with mucus and they're stuffed up, you can't smell or taste. So distinguishing whether this is a neurological problem, whether this is simply a local problem and overproduction of mucus, is an important distinction that really hasn't been made. There's also what I would call flimsy data in animals that's being used to tout the idea that, oh, COVID-19 can actually infect the CNS through the olfactory system. And I think this theory should be viewed with healthy skepticism. So it turns out when I went back and I looked at the paper that everybody was citing, it used mice that overexpress the receptor in the brain. So it's a little bit artificial because you're putting the receptor on neurons at a level and in places that it would never be. And then you're exposing those animals through inoculation in the nares to the virus. Um, and you're claiming that this is somehow evidence that uh, COVID-19 is tropic to the nervous system. Um, the other thing is if you go back and you look at the letter, literature in detail, you see that evidence that the receptors actually expressed in focal areas of the brain, it really comes from public databases 
where the quality of the uh, methods that are used to determine RNA and protein are really uncertain. And so I would say at this point um, that understanding uh, what parts of the brain are actually at risk for uh, COVID-19 based on the uh, expression of the receptor is uh, an unanswered question. So let's talk about diffuse injury now in COVID-19, because this is likely very real. And uh, it is, uh, it is a, a, a not an uncommon uh, comorbid condition. So the idea is that when you have systemic dysfunction, either in a number of different domains, um, you get decreased consciousness. Actually, it can, it can go all the way to uh, making patients comatose. Uh, as I mentioned, headache is a diffuse symptom. Sometimes dizziness, uh, depending on how it's manifested, can be seen as a diffuse symptom. Trouble concentrating, mental fatigue. I think we've all experienced this with uh, when we've had the flu or the cold. Um, you uh, have uh, cytokines that are actually generated in your body that are, are there to inhibit the ability of the virus to rep replicate and so you feel uh, tired. Um, but there are other uh, mechanisms by which uh, diffuse injury symptoms could manifest themselves in COVID-19. So if the lungs are affected and you're not able to transfer enough oxygen from the air to the blood, then that means that not enough oxygen is actually getting to the brain. And as many of you know, the brain, while it only uh, accounts for 2% of the body's weight, it, uh, it represents 20% of our oxygen consumption. Uh, and it likely reflects the fact that in order to maintain ion gradients and to be able to conduct impulses over long distances, um, the brain needs lots of energy and it gets that from oxygen. Uh, uh, there's also problems potentially in not enough blood flow. So when you have systemic infection, many uh, events happen that actually cause uh, what, what's called septic shock. And that is where you become so hypotensive that you're not able to deliver enough blood to the brain and you start manifesting symptoms. There's also uh, something that I think is very important to know because I think it's gonna be a, an important target for therapy, and that is a cytokine storm. So the idea is that uh, the, the virus, um, if it's not dealt with soon enough and effectively enough, that you get this overwhelming uh, immune response, and it actually ends up uh, damaging the body. So it's, it's as if, uh, friendly fire is actually leading to the demise of the organism. So, uh, and, and I think you, you may be aware that uh, this idea that the immune system can not only work in our favor, but work against us is not, um, it's, it's, we see it all the time with autoimmune diseases like arthritis and multiple sclerosis. So uh, this idea that the immune system can be dysregulated in ways that are not homeostatic is likely uh, what is at play in, uh, in the demise of patients with COVID-19. So, so what is an immune cytokine? So these are actually small proteins that actually bind to cell, re cell receptors to influence our ability to fight infection. And as I said, sometimes these cytokines work against us in the case of arthritis and, and maybe in viral infection. So I'm almost uh, finished. Um, but I, I, I thought it, at this point it would, be go back, go, it would be worthwhile to go back and say, well, maybe bats, they, they, we consider them kind of the, the, you know, being the culprits in all of this, but maybe there's a lot to learn from bats about how we actually treat a COVID-19 infection, and, and they may be an incredibly valuable uh, therapeutic tool. So, uh, this diagram here shows that in uh, the immune response, in non-lethal infections, you have immune recognition, and the immune system uh, recruits the appropriate responses, and you get resolution. And 
you get upregulation of these cytokines and then return to a homeostatic state. So many of you know homeostat homeostasis re refers to this term uh, uh, steady or constant. And the idea is that in response to pathologic perturbations, the body mobilizes responses that allow it to return to a steady state. And that's what happens uh, when you have host survival. But in the case of lethal infections, uh, you, the, initially the virus evades the immune system and you get a delayed or inappropriate immune response, which is massive, and a cytokine storm that actually leads to this friendly fire kind of tissue damage. So it turns out that in bats, they have mutations in genes that lead them to blunt uh, the immune response, so they never ever experience this cytokine storm. They are very good at mounting the response early and resolving it. And it suggests that the inability of humans to actually turn off their antiviral immune responses that makes us so vulnerable to viruses that bats tolerate. And it suggests that if we're focusing on ways to treat, that one of the strategies might be to figure out how to uh, drive this homeostatic uh, response. And, um, and, and you might ask, well, why would bats evolve this response? And it, it, it's, it's very interesting because it's now become apparent that when you exercise, what happens is that it can actually cause damage to the powerhouses of the cell called the mitochondria. And they release their DNA into the cytoplasm and that activates a massive immune response. And uh, that immune response uh, drives up uh, antiviral responses like interferons that may be important um, in processes such as aging. And so the bats have, have dampened that response so that it has protected them from the deleterious effects of all the exercise that they do uh, from flying. And, and I think it's, it's useful because many of you may appreciate this, is when you exercise after having not exercised for a long time, what happens? The next day you get up and you say, oh God, I'm aching and all of that. And, and what you think that's a local effect on your joints, but that actually may be the result of the inflammatory response that's being generated uh, from your muscles uh, because your mitochondria are actually releasing their DNA. So the, so the last thing I wanted to, to maybe provide some hope, because I, I think the conclusion is, is that uh, COVID-19 may not cause a lot of direct focal injury to the brain, is how are we going to get accurate information on the risk of neurological manifestations of COVID-19? And the problem that we currently have is there's incredible confirmation bias and selection bias in our information. And, and I think our one hope may be the small little country uh, to the north of us uh, called Iceland. And it, it may provide answers that others cannot. Many of you may be aware that there are 360,000 people who live in Iceland and they have incredibly careful cataloging of the health status of all of their citizens. And so this allows them to do remarkable studies, uh, not only uh, population studies, not only of, of genetic diseases, but also of infections. So it turns out there's a company called Decode, which has made its, its uh, uh, which has grown really on the leveraging this incredible resource uh, from the government. And what they have, are now doing is they're testing symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals in Iceland. And they've been able to look at who's infected and not infected in 18,000 uh, people in Iceland. That's 5% of the population. And what they're finding is a more unbiased view of COVID-19 effects. So 50% of the people who are positive are asymptomatic. And the way that we would probably interpret this is those people are asymptomatic at a time when they're infected, and they're probably going to go on to be symptomatic. And so maybe you're catching people early in their course. Um, this testing currently is random but voluntary. 
So there is still some selection bias in the way that it's being done, but the country is rapidly moving towards mandating that everybody get tested. And the advantage of this system now is we're gonna be able to look at people who are having neurological manifestations or other manifestations and say, what is it about their history that might have led them uh, to this problem? And I think this is highlighted. There was an article yesterday in the New York Times where they talked about, oh, CNS manifestations of COVID-19 and a patient with Parkinson's disease who came in who was manifesting worsening symptoms. And so if somebody has an underlying neurological condition, it's very likely that if you put this cytokine storm on top of it, it's gonna make their symptoms worse. So, um, so this data set um, from Iceland will be uh, remarkable. So sequencing um, has revealed, um, and the other fascinating thing is they're not just testing whether the, the individuals are positive for the virus or not, what they're testing is they're actually sequencing the virus in everybody who's infected. And what they're finding is, is that there are different mutations in the RNA that can be ascribed to different regions of the world. So Italy's form of COVID-19 is mutated in a different way than the ones from the West Coast. And it may start to explain why there's so many deaths in Italy and why there are so few deaths in Singapore. Um, but this type of information will be gold uh, moving forward. And uh, I'd like to finish by uh, thanking uh, Christine and Sophia for organizing this. Um, it's uh, a privilege to be able to uh, share with you some of, of these thoughts, which actually uh, should not be seen as the last word. I'm happy uh, to provide um, uh, references um, as you know, many of the top scientific journals um, are making their COVID-19 informational uh, uh, bases uh, accessible to everyone. Um, so uh, journals like Cell and Nature and Science, and the information in there uh, is, uh, in cases even where they don't have data, the perspectives on how we inter interpret the data that's actually emerging are um, really uh, insightful and remarkable. Thank you so much, Raj. Okay, so I have some questions for you. Are you ready from our audience? Yes, yes. Okay, wonderful. First question, about letting fever rise, is there a limit at which you would advise taking acetaminophen or other medications? Right, so it's a good question. I, I think there isn't um, a lot of uh, specific data that informs what the limits are. Uh, I think the, the, the uh, studies have been done where they've compared treating people uh, with a fever at uh, 38.5 degrees centigrade versus 40, and they found that people who were treated more aggressively did worse. So obviously, if somebody's temperature is 104, 105, 106, um, that's, uh, that's probably uh, areas where you're going to get into uh, problems and damage. So, um, uh, so I think that, uh, it, you know, it, 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 we're really talking about uh, milder fevers. Okay. Um, next question. I'd like to know how patients are being treated in hospitals. Is it for pneumonia? Right. So it's, it's a great question. Um, currently, uh, the treatments are really supportive treatments. As you, any of people have know, is there are, uh, there, there are antivirals that are being tested. So there are antivirals out on the market. We talked a little bit about how uh, these antivirals actually, um, uh, we talked a little bit about the biology of antivirals, but the antiviral medications that are actually on the market are ones that induce interferon responses, shut down uh, metabolism so the virus can't replicate. Uh, but, but much of the supportive treatment, uh, much of the treatment is supportive where people are being put on ventilators and being carried until their antibody responses de develop and then neutralize. But uh, I, I, there is another approach that's being taken where uh, they're, they're doing what's called passive immunity where you can collect antibodies from people 
who have already been infected and who've resolved, and then you transfer those antibodies to somebody who's really sick. The final thing I wanted to say is people might be asking, well, how does hydroxychloroquine work in all of this? Well, it's thought to work by inhibiting the ability of the virus to be internalized into the cell at the point of um, where the, once it's bound, it, it's internalization uh, into the cell. Okay, next question. How possible is it that not only people, but packaging, for example, from grocery stores, items or um, delivery packages from UBS, how possible is it that that can contain active virus? Yeah, so it's a great question. So it's, it's thought that the virus survives better on, on, sub, on services like stainless steel, uh, plastic. Um, it's thought it can survive up to eight hours. It survives less well on fab, fabric and cardboard, but it can survive up to four hours on those substances. So I think you have to be cautious about, um, uh, uh, you know, when you receive those packages about um, wiping them down, maybe. Um, it, it, we, I will, will confess, you know, I'm at particular risk and we haven't um, been doing that. But it is, it, you should know that the, 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 the virus will survive for three or four hours on cardboard services. Okay, next question. Um, this is a this is a sciencey one, so get ready. Um, recently published in the Journal of uh, Medicine Virology, uh, just recently, um, there was a claim made that uh, the coronavirus has been able to spread via synapses so connected uh, connected in the root to the um, cardiorespiratory center from mechanoreceptors in the lung and lower respiratory airways. Do you have any comments about that finding? Yeah, so I, I, I think it gets back to this idea that, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, 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 I've read the article and it's thought that what would happen is the virus going through the nose would go to the olfactory bulb and then uh, the neurons uh, that actually, some of the neurons that are involved in uh, smell would actually go back to the brainstem where it could infect other neurons, uh, which are involved in controlling respiration. Um, I would think, I think as many of the clinicians in the audience know, that when somebody's on a ventilator, people know whether the problems are a result of a decreased respiratory drive or a result of pneumonia and fluid filling up in the lungs. And uh, I uh, think at this point, um, it, it, it surprises me that if the mechanoreceptor idea weren't more, uh, weren't more significant or had more validity, that you wouldn't get emerging claims from uh, ICUs that suggest oh, we're seeing real problems in respiratory drive. So I think it's an interesting hypothesis, but uh, um, it, it may be that once we find ways, it's sort of like what happened with HIV, when we find ways that we can start to treat the acute infections that allow people to survive, we're gonna start to see more neurological manifestations. But right now, the data is really highly speculative and would be, I think, uh, appropriately classified as um, hypothetical. Great, thank you. And Dr. Rattan, we have a lot of questions. So we, can we yeah, take so five, more minutes, five more yeah, minutes I'm of happy. your time? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, um, in the polio epidemic, epidemics in the last century, many children were put on iron lungs. Is that the equivalent of modern ventilators? Uh, yes, the simple answer is yes. The thing about modern ventilators is they're it's extremely nuanced because you essentially, uh, there are all these parameters that can be modulated in the ventilator now to um, really address the specific abnormality that a patient is having and um, to facilitate their ability ultimately to get off the ventilator. And 
So as opposed to uh, iron lung, which was more one size fits all, um, modern ventilators are extremely uh, sophisticated. And this is, you know, I think the, the other thing that people don't talk about, but they mention, and that is that uh, ventilators, um, it's not only having enough ventilators, but it's having the people who know how to operate those ventilators. And it's not everybody um, has that capacity. It doesn't, every type of medical training doesn't facilitate your ability to do that. Okay, great. Um, next question, how do asymptomatic individuals pass along the virus? Yeah, so it's a great question. I think probably they do it because uh, the virus is maybe being uh, shed into the small amounts of uh, mucus that we normally produce or in our saliva. And as you speak, uh, air droplets are generated and those can be uh, uh, deposited on surfaces or uh, actually land on other individuals. Okay, next we have a question about spinal cord injury. How is a person with spinal cord injury without any breathing issues, but has RCPS seen as being compromised? Yeah, so I, I think it's really about, so I think if you don't have any, any, it's really about what is the status of the respiratory mus musculature and, um, and is it, um, are, do you have, uh, the help of the diaphragm, uh, or are you just using your accessory respiratory muscles to help you expand your lungs? And so I think it's all about reserve. I mean, I'm, I, this, I confess, this is not, yeah, I'm a neurologist, and uh, frankly, I haven't been uh, practicing in the last more than a decade. So I, I, I would, uh, I'll be happy to get more, a more detailed answer to that question. But I think intuitively, um, if, uh, if you have any weakness around the muscles that are normally used to optimally inflate your lungs, if, you're, if you have an infection, you are at increased risk. Great. We'll get, we'll get that answer to Jill when <clears throat> we have something um, from you. Thank you. Um, next question. How significant <clears throat> is the 12% of the RNA in humans that are distinct from that RNA, and how long would it take to evolve? Right. So, so I think I may, I think the, the issue, issue is, is, is that COVID-19 is 80, 88% identical to other coronaviruses, but it's different. So the RNA that I was referring to is not human RNA, but COVID-19 RNA that's now in, been, been isolated from humans. And, and that's sort of, I think the, the, the information that connects uh, COVID-19 to bats is not only the, the fact that uh, coronavirus, it's, it's, uh, it's very similar to uh, other coronaviruses, but also that COVID-19 uses the ACE2 receptor. And it turns out that that receptor is also highly homologous between bats and humans. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting to to hypothesize that it may have evolved as a receptor for a virus even before it developed its sophisticated enzymatic functions. Speaking of ACE2, um, are there polymorphisms in the population in the ACE2 receptor that may lead to differential susceptibility to the infection, as, it, as is in the case with HIV and other viruses? Yeah, I think it's a great question. So. You know, I mean, <clears throat> again, I think I've read some of this literature and uh, people are just, have just crystallized the interactions between the C-terminal domain of COVID-19's um, S1 protein, that's the spike protein, and uh, understand how it interacts with ACE2. And what's really interesting is, is that the domains that are used for a uh, COVID-19 are different than the domains that are used for SARS-CoV-1. And what it means is there's no, none of the vaccines that were used for SARS-CoV-1 will work for COVID-19. How polymorphisms in ACE2 might influence 
that uh, interaction, I, I think, is a great question, but hasn't been explored. Last question, Dr. Rattan, and again, thank you so much. Is there any data available yet about the time course of the infection, i.e. infection of symptoms to critical care to outcome? Yeah, so I think that uh, there is data, and I think it's like the average asymptomatic time mean is like five and a half days. Um, and, uh, and again, I, I can get specific information on what the, the time course is, but I think a lot of it probably depends on how, so the, the innate immune responses are, um, are, are critical. The idea is you, you, you know, and how you activate those and whether you overactivate them I mean, a, a lot of things are, are dependent. There are a lot of factors that are dependent on how that course would differ from individual to individual, including, as we talked about, uh, mutations in the virus that might occur in specific populations. So I, I think it's, um, it's a really good question, um, but um, I don't think we have a, a ton of good data, but I will tell all of you, keep your eyes on Iceland because there's lots of uh, really important data that's emerging there. Thank you so much again, Dr. Rattan. And in closing, we at the Burke Neurological Institute would like to thank everyone for their time and participation today. We will email the links to this recorded webinar and the COVID-19 resource page on our website to all the registered participants. Please share with anyone who may need them. Lastly, we will be sending out a webinar survey Please give us your feedback so you can help us to help you. Have a great weekend. Stay well, stay safe, and stay informed. Thank you for joining us.